when you're talking about a population health management group, you know, you you or a population health management program where you're trying to drive an outcome or unwind a behavior that's been going on for years, you 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 literally can't do that with just sales and marketing tactics. Have you noticed how much commercials have changed? Consumer brands used to flaunt fancier features, facts and figures about their products, but you don't see that much anymore, do you? Think about it. At the same time Kodak was selling the idea of better cameras, Apple sold the idea that capturing meaningful moments brings us closer together. What do you think worked? Companies have figured out that engaging consumers on a deeper, more personal level, their values and aspirations, pays off big over the long term. Population health management and wellness programs are lagging way behind in their understanding of where motivation comes from, which is sad considering their subject matter. Their strategies start and end with where to place the incentive. But how do incentives really influence behavior change and motivation? And how can we set our health programs up for sustained engagement and successful outcomes? That's an essential question, and this is the NudgeCast. Let's start big picture, and I want to start with you, Steve. Um, if we can just talk a little bit about, kind of, kind of frame what motivates people, what factors influence people's motivation to change from a high level, and then we'll kind of dive into how incentives influence that from there. Does that sound good? That sounds, sounds absolutely perfect. So the first thing is, and if you followed some of the podcasts in the past, there's significant individuality in all motivation. And each person has a way in which they are motivated to do basic behaviors. And think of yourself and think of reasons why you may or may not do things. But when you look from a scientific perspective, this has been broken down to show that motivation, uh, you've heard of intrinsic motivation, those that are within, you know, this desire, this, this uh, reason uh, within yourself for um, enjoyment or, um, and it can get even more specific. Matt uh, does a, a good job and talks about this people's why, you know, why you do something is oftentimes uh, is, is going to be a strong uh, intrinsic motivator. Uh, if you have a strong enough why for doing something, you're more highly motivated to continue with that behavior versus an extrinsic motivator, which we're going to be talking more specifically about, which would be an incentive that's something that the stimulus or something external that comes in and um, in the form maybe of a reward as an incentive, uh, which is meant to compel someone to take an action or change their behavior. But the other part about this, about motivation in the high level, is in reality, we really, we really can't motivate other people. You know, I think back to my college football days where you'd be in the, in the locker room and the coach would be giving the big you rah rah speech and, you know, you're getting all pumped up and all this motivation and it's all extrinsic, you know, and, and then the doors open from the locker room and you run outside and it's like, holy mackerel, look at the size of that team. <laughs> you know, so, so it's, it, and so that extrinsic motivation can only take you so far. You have to have that intrinsic motivator, which says, you know, gosh, they're huge, but you know what, I'm going to go out and get the job done. So in reality, if we can't motivate someone, which we really can't, and, I, I, and that's probably maybe a shot in the, in the back for some people, but what we do in the health, successful health professionals is we set up a motivational environment for mm -hmm. people, an individual environment that helps them become intrinsically motivated. So that is, is what uh, uh, our goal should be and not per se be trying to motivate someone to do, uh, to do an action. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important thing to frame for people is that, you know, you're not, your job is not to, you know, make them change. You're not acting on them to get them to do this. You're kind of setting up the right environment through which they can figure it out for themselves in some ways. It's kind of a simplified way to, to look at it, right? Yeah, and they make the decision. They make the personal decision. They have to, at some point, for long-term change. And we're talking long-term. We're not talking about, you know, we got to wait for 10 years to see the change. No, we're talking about, you know, a couple months. To uh, It doesn't mean that um, an extrinsic motivator can't be beneficial at the beginning. Yeah. But it will not be successful in the long run 
Um, once, because I mean, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, why that's the case. Right. And I mean, if you think about, you know, just this at a very, I want to make sure we're bringing this back down to some pr pretty basic levels at times too. One thing that an incentive is obviously good at is getting someone to act immediately on say like a sale, you know, um, I see the sale in the window, it ends in a week that they're incentivizing me to purchase that thing now. So I'm going to go and do it. And that's just a one-time transaction. That's going to stimulate an actual action there. Um, but we're living in a space where we're talking about, you know, maybe a weight management program, maybe a smoking cessation program, maybe, you know, a program with the ultimate goal of lowering, I don't know, LDL levels, um, things that are long-term outcomes changes. What is the problem really with letting or with incorporating financial, I guess, incentives into say anything within a, a longer term program like that, Steve? Yeah, the, there's a significant problem when you look not at the short term, but the long term, because the research does show uh, in, if you look at the breadth of the research that, you know, financial incentives in general can get people to sign up for a quote unquote program. Um, it's like what you just said about the sale. However, there are significant shortcomings when you're looking at long term. So what you'll, what you'll find is programs uh, that, we, that we have that we're in charge of getting people to sign up for. We're basically, us as health professionals, are incentivized to have as many people sign up as possible, which incentives will help get people signed up for that. However, we wonder why they're not uh, successful programs or we're not seeing the results we want. It's because there are shortcomings because once you start to take away this incentive or once it starts to decrease or once um, it doesn't have as much of an impact or the real world comes into play that, oh, this incentive, gosh, it got me to sign up, but I didn't know I was going to have to do all this. Well, I'm out of here. I'll keep the incentive. Um, so there's a, there's a, there is the research does support that the short term benefit of incentives can be beneficial but in the long term, it is not. And then the, the other thing I want to say is it's, it's similar to everything we, we see with, with behavior and with the people we work with. It's an individual thing. Yes, there's going to be a small percentage that is all ready to take action, and this incentive just pushes them over the top. But these mm -hmm. people most likely were, were, you know, were, were a small percentage. We're going to get to that point sooner or later. Right. It, but for the ones that are a little bit more reserved, and not ready, they don't have their mo enough intrinsic motivation, they haven't really uh, developed a why for making this change, then they get an incentive and that's going to be a, a slap in the face. As a matter of fact, it can work as a negative. Some of the research shows that it can work as a negative because now the individual says, well, I'm not responsible for my health anymore. Um, I have to wait for the next incentive. And so it's completely extrinsically motivating for them. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think you know, what she said there at the end is an important point where it switches. I mean, literally the, the reason, like you said, for the motivation to actually take action changes. So um, if the reason someone actually takes action is because they're motivated by having a few extra dollars in their pocket, then, you know, when the next thing comes up that is supposed to keep them sustained in that program and engaged in that program and, they only signed up because they want a little extra money in their pocket. Well, they're obviously not going to be motivated to take that next step. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, if they signed up because they, you know, found this internal reason and understood it from the beginning, then they obviously have the same motivator that's still sticking with them throughout this entire experience. So is that a good way to explain like why that's actually happening? That people are maybe um, more people, might buy into it immediately, but they're much more likely to drop off over time if incentives are in place. Yes, I, I, that's absolutely right. It doesn't mean, but, but now, now, now interject a health professional who has developed, started to develop a relationship mm -hmm. because they were able to open the door for a few of these people. So here's where a positive part can come into play is if the health professional uses their tools and their resources and their communication and their vocabulary to, uh, to work with that person to develop a more intrinsically 
powerful motivational reason why they're doing it, mm. then, um, then they can switch them over. So, but the problem is that's usually not the case. Right. It's usually let's get them signed up because I, as a health professional running this program, am, you know, am, am looked at upon success as being who signs up. And that's my, the, the biggest metric that's used for me. Yeah, that gets us into a whole um, other conversation that we, I think we need to have because, yeah. you know, with the, you know, groups that we work with, say we're working with a um, third party administrator, or a health plan or somebody who is managing, you know, say a chronic care management program. Um, and they obviously aren't doing this. Some individual isn't out there managing this entire program by themselves. They have a team. Um, they're managing that team and trying to get them to um, the team as well to engage these participants, uh, these members um, in a way that's going to lead to the ultimate goal, which is got to be in a health program, sustained engagement and in order to get the outcome. So sustained engagement has to be the goal. Um, so like you said, if a lot of these programs and groups that we work with do this are telling their team members that their goal and the performance metric that they're going to be judged by is the number of enrollees, the number of people who enroll in the program, then why is that a problem? I think it's a pretty clear problem, but why is that a problem? Yeah. The problem is then the focus becomes uh, just getting someone to initially just sign up without um, investigating the reason why or preparing this individual for the act upcoming action in a real world situation. Now there's been some recent research that, that actually specifically addresses this in the sense that if you, t you know, target some of the incentives specifically to that person, um, I know this sounds mind boggling because people are saying, well, I might, I have, you know, 5,000 people out there. How am I going to target it, you know, to 5,000 individuals, but that, that's not what we're talking about. First of all, if you're thinking you're going to sign up 5,000 out of 5,000, uh, you're already setting yourself up for failure. <laughs> so you, you want to look at ways of trying to um, uh, uh, connect with the individuals that probably will need it most and will end up showing the greatest benefit to the, uh, to the decrease in healthcare costs and the increase in health, obviously. And that's what we're looking for. So if we're looking for them, an individual um, uh, communication, an individual um, understanding of them is paramount. And as I've said in many of the discussions I've had in writings, is that the time you spend up front on developing this relationship or uh, using specific wordings in some of your outreach can, um, is a great way to get at large numbers of these uh, individuals on an individual level, even though you're sending uh, maybe a message or some kind of uh, some information in, in, uh, to the whole group, you are actually targeting individuals with the, the vocabulary that vocabulary that you use. Mm. So um, yeah. So, so this way you can, like the research does show is that if we target, if we, if we give people individual reasons why they would do this, why they would want to participate for the long term, because, you know, Matt made a great point about this isn't, we're not talking about consumers and we're telling uh, consumers who are buying products. I mean, how many times have you been up at night flipping through the channels and, and you're looking at, Oh, I can lose 25 pounds in three days. Wow. I just have to buy this product. Yeah. Well, I want this quick and, and we're, I'm not a, a genius to tell you we're in this, you know, quick response. We want the results right away environment. That's what we're in. But that, that does not lead to long-term success in the programs that we are involved with, with the blood pressure, with the diabetes, with the smoking cessation, all those things. Those are long-term, as Matt said, they're ingrained behaviors within these people that, that uh, it's not that they want to be like this, it's not that they, that they've made the choice. It's that they're caught in this negative, this negative cycle that we as health professionals don't want to keep that negative cycle going, or we don't want to trick them into coming into our program because they're going to make some money knowing that in two months they're going to be gone and they're going to go back to the same behaviors because the only reason they came in was for a few extra bucks in their pocket. It's not fair. So I, mean, I, I think just to, just to compliment that. So I think, you know, if you're going to use incentives to 
to spur some sort of short-term change of some sort or, or really short-term engagement. And when we say short-term, we're talking about this, the, the research on it, what's uh, Dr. Steve, it's it only, they're very short lived, like a few months is about the, the, the longest shelf life you're going to see. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If that. So, yeah. So, I mean, if you want to, if you want to do that, uh, great, you know, it's going to cost, it, it co- these, these incentives are not cheap. They cost organizations a lot of money. So what we hate to see is when you've got incentives and there's nothing behind it, there's no long-term strategy for engagement beyond the incentives. And, and then we, you know, we have, you know, management wondering why this, pro- this program is not effective, why it's not driving any sort of change that really is impacting their, their bottom line or impacting productivity or whatever it is they're looking for. If I can give you a specific example that I've used personally uh, with people is wearable devices as an incentive. And so um, not everyone that I work with, have worked with, is excited about having a wearable device. They they just don't want. Some are. So um, one of the ways that I've implemented is, is I will borrow or loan, you know, pretty much anybody a wearable device if they want to wear it. And I will use that as part of my coaching and my interaction with them. And depending on how they use that device in terms of their, their motivational environment, their, their intrinsic reason why they're doing something, then they keep it. If not, then it's returned to me and we use other means or no mean of measurement in that case. So, yes, for a few of them, it, it's, great. it's a great incentivizer. For others, it's not. See, originally, I would give everyone one. It, you know, here's a here's a hundred fifty dollar wearable device. This is going to be great. This is going to get you motivated to move. No, it doesn't. It ends up oh, they lost it. They the battery ran out, so they didn't replace it. Uh, they just don't like to wear it. They don't like to see how poor they're doing. You know, others are like, yeah, this is great. This really keeps me. By the end of the day, if I'm not at a certain number, I really want to get out and get my my cardio numbers up. So it's, that's the individual level. It sounds like a great idea up front, very expensive, like Matt says, but it's, it's not helping in the long term. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it's important, uh, maybe even the most important lesson from a high level on, um, from what we're talking about today is that, you know, you, you certainly can't assume that we can communicate to the values of every individual person <laughs> with any, any incentive, which is basically what your assumption is when you're putting that incentive out there. I, I just say use caution in, uh, with incentives. And I, I think that the next podcast, if I can do a shameless plug for, for listening to the next one, <laughs> I think we need to talk about, you know, how we as professionals are uh, the metrics that are used by our higher ups to say we're successful or not. Because unfortunately, signing up individuals who are not ready to make change is a train wreck just ready to happen. And incentives can just contribute to that. All right. Thank you to Dr. Steve Firemilk. Thank you to Matt Essex. And thank you guys for listening. If you want to get in touch with me, my email is just phil at nudgecoach.com. Feel free to reach out and ask questions about the show or about Nudge in general. Um, again, you can find our more information on us at nudgecoach.com and keep an eye out for the next episode guys, because we're going to talk a little bit more about incentives and motivation. Uh, the next time we get back together until then, we'll talk to you soon.